Hi, this is Emily Lutringer with the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. This is a workshop designed for mental health professionals, culturally sensitive mental health and in international humanitarian crises. Mental health is an important component of humanitarian emergency responses, but has only begun being added in the last 20 years. Some programs still do not have mental health components for clients, and many do not have mental health support for mission staff. Doctors Without Borders, or MSF, is one of the few organizations which implements mental health care for both clients and staff. It initially faced a lot of criticism and skepticism from within the organization in developing a mental health program. However, they used scientific research to show the importance, need, and results, and gain support over time. The majority of this workshop is based on a presentation about mental health in MSF programs. Initial Emotional Responses by Survivors to Traumatic Events Emotional responses are commonly felt trauma following a traumatic event. However, individuals react differently, showing none of these or shifting between them. It's possible for a survivor to simultaneously need psychological support while also being able to help others and solve problems. These are completely normal reactions, though some may feel shame, guilt, inadequacy, and feel like fa failures for having them. Numbing may appear apathetic, stunned, confused, or dazed. Client may report feeling surreal. They may appear calm, followed by denial or self-isolation. The response to aid workers may be passive, or they may try and regain a sense of control through resistance, rebellion, or antagonizing. Arousal. This includes intensified fear and somatic complaints of anxiety, such as pounding hearts, tense muscles, muscle pains, and stomach upsets. It, they may express fears that are both rational and irrational, and may have heightened activity. Diffuse anxiety is where one experiences hyperarousal. They struggle making decisions, they are unable to react, they have a heightened hurdle, startle response. They may express feeling unsafe, feeling abandoned, they may worry about being separated from loved ones and long for relief. Survivor guilt, self-blame or shame at having survived when others did not. Clients become preoccupied with thinking about the disaster and ruminate about what they could have done differently. They may feel responsible for the suffering of others. Conflicted nurturance, this is where someone feels dependent on others, but is also suspicious of their reasons for helping. They feel that no one really understands them. They may want to distance emotionally and remain detached and show irritability when others are sympathetic. Some may feel the need to be close to other people all the time, conversely. Ambivalence. They may seem apathetic or uninterested in the situation or connecting with others or learning the fate of their families or possessions. Instability. It's a roller coaster of emotions or cognitive abilities. They may have sudden anger or aggression or depression. They may cry easily. They might seem forgetful or disorganized. They report feeling vulnerable and hold to misconceptions or illusions about the crisis or disaster. They may, so severe confusion. They may appear hysterical, delusional, or have psychosis symptoms be disorganized, or have odd speech and behavior. How would you work with somebody experiencing survivor guilt? Some tips. Help individuals look at their assets rather than their losses. Emphasize what they were able to do or can do. For example, a mother who might blame herself when she ran away during an attack and had to lose one of her children in the process. You, as a counselor, could identify that she had no choice but to run. She had to run, and because of this, she was able to save four of her other children. Culturally sensitive interventions. 
Cultural sensitivity is developed by keeping an open mind, remaining humble and asking questions. Avoid imposing mental health diagnostics on individuals. Consider people as having vulnerabilities rather than pathologies. And ask yourself, what can the locals teach me about cultural psycho psychological understandings and practices? What is the norm within the community for dealing with distress? It's also important to note that lay counselors are more effective than experts in improving, fun improving functioning for most people. However, if a client presents with severe or persistent mental illness, an expert medical model tends to be better. Consider partnering with local staff to understand their indigenous psychological methods, models, and practices. Prior prioritize train the trainer models to utilize local caregivers to become mentors, counselors, and trainers who can provide long-term care and innately understand cultural views. While you might be a worker who is in the country for at most for a year, a lay caregiver can be in the situation for a much longer time and provide continuity of care. Make sure to understand the cultural context. So for example, what may appear to be psychosis with hallucinations or delusions may be considered by an individual to be spiritual possession within their culture. Work together with traditional healers and refer to their frame of reference. Seek to understand the underlying meaning. In that previous example, someone with spiritual possession might be seeking to become over, overcome with the emotion and have it almost take over their body because it's so intense. So dynamics of culture. Let's take a look at this wheel on the right. Write down five aspects which define your identity. How do these interact with each other? And how do they interact with other people in your life? How about with the culture at large that you live in? And what biases do you have? Do any of these stick out to you and rub you the wrong way? Interventions for acute suffering. A framework of person or client-centered counseling is an excellent stance in a humanitarian situation. Some of the basics of that are understanding that at the core, all humans have the same basic needs. Focus on the needs of the individual in front of you and collaborate with them on their goals. Ask how you can help. An example that MSF gave in their training video was a girl was refusing to get medical services. The medical services tried and tried to get her to comply and she wouldn't. So they called in a counselor. They wanted the counselor to try and convince the girl to go with them. Instead, the counselor asked the girl, what can I do to help? The girl did not make eye contact and seemed very ashamed. So the counselor said, you can whisper it in my ear. The girl whispered in her ear that she had wet herself because of the medical trauma. And she was so ashamed and embarrassed and felt like she needed to go clean herself up before she could go with these people um, to get medical help. So the counselor was able to respect her privacy and confidentiality um, and advocate for her to be able to go take care of her needs first. And once the girl was able to do that, she willingly went ahead and got the medical services that she needed. So make sure to help clients find their own solutions rather than give advice. It helps them to feel validated and that they're able to master the situation. Be patient. Sometimes p clients can take a long time to come around to these things on their own, but you don't want to just give them the answers. The therapeutic value of the relationship holds true across cultures. This has proven time and again to be one of the most powerful factors of treatment. Culturally based treatments 
um, that have been adapted to a specific culture are more effective. However, above and beyond that, the attitude of a counselor um, and the relationship to the client is still the most healing factor. Use reflective listening, validation, and collaboration with the client. You may need to help the client prior prioritize their needs. Which symptoms need to be dealt with first? Which needs need to be met first? For example, they may be conflicted between getting food, their health, how to find a missing loved one, or being unable to sleep because they're so worried. They may not know which thing to target first or which is the highest priority. You may not know either, and that's okay. That's something to help figure out together with them what to focus on first. You can have a framework, but build from it and be prepared to change and adapt it to each situation, each culture, and each individual. People express trauma differently between genders and ages. For example, children express trauma very differently than do adults. Generally, when you're doing humanitarian mental health work, only short-term counseling is possible. Sometimes it might be a one, three-hour session. Sometimes it might be multiple sessions. Uh, the goal is to meet the client's immediate needs. However, you do want to avoid uncovering too many wounds and doing deep intensive counseling without continuation of care. You need to share the expectations of counseling with the clients and arrange for longer term referrals if needed. Some other considerations. The needs of the client can change from moment to moment. Their process and reactions can be transitional, circular, and multi-layered and exist on a continuum. It sometimes can feel like you've made a lot of progress on one thing, all of a sudden to cycle back to the beginning. A quote from the Doctors Without Borders presentation is, the inner question to the counselor is, can you handle my pain? And the answer to that should be yes. You as a counselor should feel confident that, and be able to express confidently in your uh, way of being that you are able to hold and bear witness to their pain. Clients often come in with high levels of guilt, shame, and unresolved grief. A counselor is a bringer of hope. Having hope means that this suffering will pass, that something better will come in the future. Remember that as an inter international humanitarian worker, you might only be in a place for a year, at the most, a locally trained lay counselor can be a support for much longer times. Support for services builds upon itself. Initially, people might be distrustful or resistant to seeking counseling. However, after helping one person, they will often advocate to others in the community that counseling was helpful for them. And maybe if they have a similar problem, they could try it too. Not everything needs a mental health specialist. You don't have to do it all. Sometimes you might need to find another person who can specialize in training a manager on communication skills so that they can handle situations before they become conflicts or before mental health issues. Um, maybe that's all that it's needed. Sometimes counseling is for an acute problem, but sometimes the perception of the situation brings a chronic or in remission problem to the surface. Confidentiality. Now we all know about what confidentiality means within our practices um, in our local areas. Now it's important to understand that building trust can take time in education and building rapport with the community. There may be high levels of distrust towards the counselor, especially if a counselor serves both sides of a conflict. There may be concerns over confidentiality, and some people may really think that the counselor could be a spy. This is a real concern uh, when you consider that that might be a life or death situation for someone if their information is revealed. Sometimes a lay counselor from the opposite side of the conflict can be very healing. 
Now, obviously, this comes with a lot of risks. However, if it is possible to do in a safe and confidential way, it can build a shared humanness across both sides and be a source of healing for a client where this counselor who has been sort of the enemy is suddenly bearing witness to their suffering. Individuals also often worry about gossip and stigma within their own communities. It's important to educate individual clients and the community at large about who you are, what your role is, and what confidentiality is, and what its limitations are. Validating local knowledge to identify solutions. Community interventions. It's easy to become overwhelmed by everything that is going wrong. Focus on what is going right, what is working in the community. Build on to and amplify those successes. It's great if you see the community doing grassroots things themselves that are building positive coping skills, and you can help build off that. Sometimes it's necessary to work with the system to help an individual, such as bringing in medical staff and teaching families about how to best support them. Groups can be useful um, in connecting people together and helping them recognize they're not alone in what they're experiencing. A quote from MSF is, the whole fabric of these communities are undermined by violence. The original systems and services and functioning may no longer work. An improved individual who's been in counseling and then you drop them back into a toxic environment, they'll deteriorate again. Therefore, it's important to also simultaneously address community and environmental needs as much as possible. Collaborate with the community to develop systems and interventions. This in itself is healing for people. It acknowledges their suffering and it remembers their suffering. It doesn't let that be forgotten. It allows them to give back and share their message and their story. And it also gives the message that we are helping you to help yourselves rather than we're coming in because we know better and we can do everything for you. We're not trying to fix it. We're coming in to support them. It helps also to build ownership of programs and interventions and ensures that they're culturally compatible with that group. Sometimes people can feel invaded or attacked by a counselor when asked about personal problems, such as domestic violence. Uses, use of community interventions can help change that conversation. For example, uh, MSF gave the example of a, uh, of a group of refugees putting on a play about domestic violence within the refugee camp. This allowed other refugees to watch the play and start having conversations on their own about that and starting to change the perception. This let people seek out counseling and support on their own, which was much more effective than trying to pry into their lives. So on the next page, I have an activity. Uh, following SAMHSA's guidelines for facilitating community discussions on mental health. So if you wanted to go into a community and get feedback from that community um, around what mental health looks like for them and what supports might be needed, you could use a framework like this. However, how would you adapt this for different humanitarian settings and cultures? Are there places or situations that this framework would be ineffective? Integrating mental and physical health care. 
integrated health. Invisible wounds of mental health are more long-term than the physical wounds. People may come to primary care complaining of somatic complaints repeatedly. Often, this is a signal that there is a mental health issue occurring. Integrated mental health can also help with supporting physical health, such as a patient who's refusing a necessary medical procedure, such as an amputation, um, where they really need to talk out their fears and emotions and really a lot of confusion and not understanding with the situation until they're able to come to the recognition of the necessity of the treatment on their own. When working in a situation caused by illness or epidemic disorders, counseling can help by keeping hope up, even if there is no cure, such as with Ebola, and helps clients make sense of what is happening. In cases where there's no cure, being able to keep one's hope up is often the strongest predictor of them being able to survive. Also, you can counsel family members of a infected person. They might be dealing with lots of fear and insecurity and they might not be able to visit or see their loved one. You can also work on social problems and stigma and assist with recovered patients re-entering re the community. Um, this has been a problem with uh, patients with HIV, for example. There can be a lot of stigma. So they might need a lot of social support and processing uh, with individual counseling, but also developing programs that address the community at large um, in developing awareness around uh, reducing stigma for the illness. Providing preparation and assistance to mission staff. Vicarious trauma. The psychological care unit, oh, I'm sorry, the psychosocial care unit is unique to MSF, but we should be advocating to see this implemented across many other humanitarian organizations. They address questions and concerns of staff before they leave on a mission and debrief them when they return and provide continuing after care after they return um, through their readjustment period. They also provide critical support during the mission. This is done via confidential phone calls. Um, these sessions last one to four hours. It can be a single session or multiple sessions. However, if it seems to be more than a few sessions, it's probably best to make a referral for longer term care. Um, it really has no bearing on the client's selectment for future service or determinations of fitness for duty. Um, it helps uh, staff clients deal with stressors of being in the field, such as problems with living arrangements, team dynamics, culture shock, incidents with their family back home, vicarious trauma reactions, etc. For incidents that affect multiple team members, an additional support team will be sent out to provide mental health services on site and support for the mental health team that's working with clients um, of the disaster. The whole team is often impacted. If a team member gets sick or even a relative or family member um, or friend of the team member gets sick in epidemic situations, um, oftentimes the whole team will follow along with what's happening with that one person. And if that one person passes away, the team ends up devastated. Additionally, media can stimulate fear around the staff, causing them to be stigmatized upon their return home, which leaves them feeling isolated and shamed rather than feeling celebrated for all the work they've done. Additional staff stressors and trauma. Stra staff experience a loss of natural social supports when deployed internationally, and their team must become their support network or their family. Support is critical to their well being. It's important to begin developing this network pre deployment. Staff can become traumatized by being surrounded by violence. They might assume they're in a safe location like a hospital, but they're also experiencing what locals experience. The locals may have become desensitized over time to violence, which has occurred over many years, while to staff, this is new and extremely unnerving. They may have trouble finding hope 
and dealing with existential issues, unsure if they're really making a difference, powerlessness, or if the conflict will ever end. There's a high risk of staff to fall back to negative coping mechanisms. Local, locally recruited staff may struggle with communicating and connecting with the international staff. However, they need to be able to do that as they are one solidarity team. Local staff, but also face the additional stressor that they're permanently living in this same situation while they're also working to help in it. International staff have some relief in that at some point they will leave they will go back to their quote unquote normal life. Supporting staff. Staff tend to make it very hard. Oh, I'm sorry. Staff tend to take it very hard when a manager is critical of them. It's really important to give them positive feedback, acknowledge their difficult work conditions and give them the idea that somebody believes in them. It's also important to cultivate vicarious forgiveness. This is the idea of not resenting those who have harmed the clients of the population that the counselor is working with. Mental health providers themselves need therapy and mental health. It's really important to encourage the mental health staff team on the ground to be seeking out their own support and mental health to processing what they're going through. It's also extremely important to build support networks. This can be with family back home, with friends, with their mentor or supervisor and their team. It's also important to maintain self-care routines. Uh, also coming with an attitude, approaching situations with humility and gratitude. It's also important to uphold the values of the Geneva Con Convention for individuals and also as an organizational community. It's important to uphold these even if the miss mission seems to have been a failure. And you can also encourage staff to be using the organization. Think of it as them building their career and also growing personally and professionally. So here's an activity um, for developing self-care strategies. On the wheel on the left here, um, there's all kinds of different self-care strategies um, in all different realms of life. Um, it's really important to choose at least one from each category to really be balanced. Now, looking at this or just thinking about it, what are some self-care strategies that you do right now or something that you've thought about and would like to be doing? Now, would any of those need to look different if you were doing them in the context of being an international humanitarian worker in the midst of a crisis? You must consider also cultural practices and norms in other regions. Some of these might not be appropriate. For example, it might not be possible to go to a symphony or ballet um, while you're in the middle of a war zone. Um, you can write down five specific daily self-care strategies that you would use in a situation. It's important to have that ahead of time while also remaining flexible and adaptable, but have an idea of five things that you can do um, and start implementing those in practice that would work within a crisis humanitarian international situation. And here are the references for this workshop. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here and I hope that you learned something and enjoyed this presentation. Here's my contact info and website. Feel free to shoot me an email or check out my website where I post uh, some of my doctoral um, essays and information. Thank you again.